Okay, then we were talking about interpolation, or we were talking about function approximation uh, more generally, right? We've got a function, or we've got function at some uh, particular point, some samples of it, and we want to come up with, say, a simple polynomial that gets pretty close to the function, and we saw we can do that, right? We didn't say that we can do it easily, but it's possible to do it. And now the goal is, well, what are some techniques that we want to really use in practice to do this? So uh, there's different sort of categories of what do I mean by function approximation. Uh, we're going to start by talking about interpolation. So in interpolation, we're given some data points. Okay, so we're given uh, xi, yi, some number of these. I'm going to start counting at zero because it makes the math easier. Of course, depending on what language you're coding in, if you're using a MATLAB, uh, take that into account. Um, and what do we do want? We want to come up with a polynomial. Okay, so we want to generate something. Okay, so some kind of simple function. Such as a polynomial, it could be something else. Okay, so such that. We recover these data points. Right, so right, function approximation generally that we talked about last time just said we want to get close to these data points or we want to get close to this function somehow. Interpolation says I'm given a fixed set of points and I want to hit these exactly. Okay, we mentioned that we are probably going to build up some sort of basis, try to, you know, some simple basis functions that we're happy to work with. You look like you have a question. Uh, so I think you said last time we're specifically going to be looking to generate a polynomial in between the points that we have. We wouldn't be extending it beyond. Ah, so you're talking about the difference between interpolation and extrapolation. So yeah, typically we'd be given, all right, here's a domain we're interested in. Here's some data that's hopefully kind of spread out through the domain. Let's try to generate a function on that domain. Now, if you want to figure out, make predictions beyond that, ugh, that's dangerous. Yeah, so if I have data points from 0 to 1, and then you say predict what's going to happen at x equals 2, um, x equals 2 is over here from your perspective, uh, well, that's dicey. We may not be able to get very accurate results here. Okay, so we talked about last time, we want to have some kind of basis. Um, the simplest basis that we could think of maybe was the monomial basis. Right, so our functions were 1, x, x squared, and so on. So we want to represent things like this. Represent p in terms of a simple basis. Okay, and then we write p of x is some sort of linear combination of these basis functions. Okay, so let's start by uh, talking about polynomials, and our big challenge, part of our challenge here is to decide what's the right basis to use. Um, again, to not only get the correct results, but to, to get things easily in a way that's well conditioned, that we can do efficiently, and things like that. What's that? We're gonna, so you might, we might want orthogonal polynomials, for example. There's different things that we might try to do. Um, maybe our first question that we should ask is, 
uh, is this really possible? Or what degree polynomial should I use, for example? Yeah, Jake. Um, when we did the Bernstein polynomials, we showed that we can get the, like, over the entire domain, they were like arbitrarily close, right? But now we're just trying to say that at these points, they match up. So yes, this is different than uh, using the Bernstein polynomial. Sam, I have your homework before you slide in there. Right, so for the, when we did the Bernstein polynomials, we were trying to say over the whole domain, we're going to stay arbitrarily close. Now, we're not talking about that. We're just saying we need something that matches exactly at these data points. So that's the difference with the t interpolation. Um, and ideally, ideally, it stays close in between, too. Um, the ideal would be we have these data points, we match these data points, and then the function can be used to make predictions in between. That's what we want to do with interpolation. You know, that's no good to just, oh, Great, we have a pretty function that fits these data points, and I'm never going to use this function to learn anything else. We want to make predictions with it. OK, so polynomials in particular. All right, so let's suppose we have some data points. The x's are distinct. Right. You don't, I don't, want, you don't want me to give you the same x value twice and say, um, you know, one of my data points is x equals 0 and y equals 0, and one of my data points is x equals 0 and y equals 1. Uh, fit a polynomial to that, right? That's, that would be impossible and bad. So I'm going to say, let's make sure these are distinct so that you're not throwing contradictions at me. Okay? Then there exists a unique polynomial okay, of degree n. Uh, or less than or equal to n, actually, so such that such that we can hit all of these data points. Okay, so this is our first question. Can we actually hope to do this? So let's see if we can uh, figure this out. Um, we know how we can. We know what a polynomial of degree n looks like. So uh, we can write p this way. Okay, p of x involves. Okay, and this is in terms of our monomial basis. Right. So we have a naught plus a one x, a two x squared, and so on. Um, some of these coefficients could be zero, so it could be that a n is zero and we get a polynomial of less than degree n. That, that's possible. Um, but this is the general form of a polynomial of up to degree n. And we know that we want to choose the coefficients, okay, so that we actually match our data. Okay, so that if I plug in Okay, so I do this now for a particular data point. Right, so I plug xi in here. I should get yi coming back out. So our question really is, right, the unknowns are these a's. Our question is, can we find a's that make this true? So our unknowns are the a's. There's n plus 1 of them, right, a0, a1, up to an plus 1. And we have n plus 1 equations that we have to fit these n plus 1 data points. Okay, and these are linear. This is a linear system, right? So this term, right, this term doesn't look linear, but remember, this is just a number when I... I get my data, I plug it in here, and this just becomes a number times my coefficients. So this really is a linear system in the A's. So we should be able to write this in a matrix vector form. So this is n plus 1 linear equations in n plus 1 unknowns, the unknowns being the A's.
All right, so if I try to write this out as a linear system, well, my first equation is for y naught when I've plugged in x naught. So I'm going to have a naught times just 1. So let's put the coefficient of a naught here. a naught times 1 plus a1 times x naught, a2 times x naught squared, okay, all the way down to a n times x naught to the n. Right, all of that times these a's. And that should give me a y naught. Right, and then we do the same thing, exactly the same thing for all the other data points. So we go down the list, and at the end we have our nth data point. And we want to match our nth value of y. All right, this matrix, yeah, Francesco. So in this proof, yes, so this is going to be a proof indeed. Um, we are imposing the shape of our polynomial basis. Yes, so we've picked ahead of time uh, our basis functions. Our basis functions are these, and we've picked how many of them we're using. Okay, so you cannot for us general uh, theorem about every possible basis. This is not a general theorem about every possible basis. That's right. Now, once you can do this, you can adapt this proof for a lot of different bases. Uh, and actually, you'll get a chance to do that in the next homework. And some of you are already thinking ahead and have emailed me questions about how to do it for the next homework. Uh, so some of those answers and some of those hints are going to come up here. Uh, this matrix has a special name. Uh, this is the Vandermond matrix. So if I do this in compact form, right, this has the form of some matrix times my vector of unknown coefficients is equal to my vector of y's. Okay, and this is called the Vandermond matrix. Okay, so our question is, you know, is this a well-posed problem? Can I really find a, a vector of A's that will make this true, that make me fit all my data points? So what I'm really asking is, right, is this a well-posed linear system? In other words, is, is this matrix here invertible? That's our question. Can I inver if I can invert this matrix, then no matter what data you give me, no matter what Y's you've given me, I'll be able to solve for the A's. So our goal is going to be to show that V is invertible. OK, so what do we remember from linear algebra? That's the question here. If I want to show that a matrix is invertible, what are some of my approaches? One of them is that the determinant has to be non-zero. OK, look at the determinant, decide if it's non-zero. What else? Another one is that if a system has a unique solution, the meaning that the, the matrix is invertible, does mean that the a homogeneous system has to have a trivial solution. The, OK, so if, for this to always, for this to be invertible, the homogeneous system should have only the trivial solution, yeah. Columns are linearly independent. Columns are linearly independent. That was yours, okay. Yeah, okay, good suggestions. You guys remember some linear algebra, that's good. Um, so I'm going to go with option number two here and look at the, linear, the homogeneous system. So let's consider the homogeneous problem. OK, 
Okay, so the homogeneous system has the form V times B equals zero. Okay, so I'm going to kind of back up and say, well, what kind of equations does that give me? That says that, well, B naught plus B1 times Xi plus B2 times Xi squared all the way down to Bn uh, times Xi to the nth should be equal to zero. And it should be equal to zero for x naught, for x1, for x2, and so on. So for i equals zero up to n. Uh, so let's look at this, right? This, we know, is an nth degree polynomial. Now, when I've said it's equal to zero, that's a statement that xi is a root of this nth degree polynomial, yes? So this means that x0 is a root, x1 is a root, all the way down to xn are all roots of this nth degree polynomial. So how many roots have I found? n plus 1. I've found n plus 1 roots, right? We know they're all distinct. We said they have to be distinct. Okay, so we have n plus 1 roots of an nth degree polynomial. It, so that should make you nervous. Right? So the fundamental theorem of algebra says this should make you nervous. Uh, what's the only way that can happen? If the coefficients are zero. If the coefficients are zero. Of course, if the b's are zero, then whatever x's I plug in are going to give me zero. But if any of the b's are non-zero, this can't happen. We can't get more than and distinct roots. So if we, we look at the fundamental theorem of algebra, this is going to tell us that all the b's must be equal to 0. Right? In other words, the homogeneous system has only the trivial solution. So the homogeneous system has only the trivial solution. Okay, and therefore, indeed, our matrix is invertible. There's other approaches you could take to show it's invertible. Uh, this is a, a simple one. And then we say, OK, in other words, right? this has a unique solution. No matter what data I have. And that means that using this particular monomial basis, right? So using, looking at nth degree polynomials for interpolating these n plus 1 data points, the interpolating polynomial is going to be uniquely defined, right? Given these n plus 1 data points, there's exactly one polynomial of degree maximum n that will fit these points. Uh, professor, yeah. <clears throat> that last statement that you mentioned, it, that also means that those coefficients that we have, uh, the b's, are they unique? The b's are uniquely zero, that's right. right. So that's what the fundamental theorem of algebra gives us. Of course, you know, if I just look at this system, b equals zero is, of course, the solution of this system. The point is we needed to show it was the only solution. And, and that's what the fundamental theorem of algebra says. There's, there's no way to come up with this many roots of the polynomial unless the coefficients are zero. So here we can say. We did what we wanted, the interpolating polynomial is indeed uniquely defined. Okay. 
Any other questions on that? We can put to the last home or just make it this, uh, maybe to this solution. This, you can use this on the last, <laughs> on the next homework, yeah. Thanks. So this uh, probably answers a lot of the email questions I've been getting this week. Um, all right, so polynomial interpolation is uniquely defined. Um, we got a system for how we could do it, right? We could use this basis, the monomial basis, um, build up this matrix, invert it, solve for the A's, and we've got our coefficients. So that's an, an approach. One approach for polynomial interpolation is build this system. Okay, and solve for the coefficients. So, are we done with polynomial interpolation? We know how to do it? So I see some people shaking their heads no, and I'm not sure if they have a justification for that beyond that's what they think I'm going to say. Uh, what, are, what would be some challenges of doing it this way? Solving the system, right? We have to invert a linear system. Um, so, you know, that might be more expensive than we want to do. If, this, if n is pretty big, if we have a lot of data, then an n plus 1 by n plus 1 system is pretty big to in invert, and then that may not be something we're excited to do. Um, any other possible issues? Distribution of error across the points. Okay, distribution of error across the points. Um, if you, so error is a big one here. Intervals. The intervals, yes. Yeah. So um, in just this approach, you know, if, if I have no control over the data and you say do ter polynomial interpolation with this data, um, the polynomial is uniquely defined. It's just a matter of let's build the polynomial. Oh, so that's our first question. But yeah, error, error we want to be able to come up with these coefficients accurately and efficiently, not invert a big matrix. Uh, so just here's a little, which I'm not going to, going to go into too much detail. And I've put a paper on Canvas, some of you have looked at already, on Vandermann matrix. But let's just suppose the nodes are equally spaced, okay, 0, 1 over n, 2 over n, and so on, up to 1, equally spaced. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into all the uh, details of it now. There's a paper on Canvas that you can read. That one thing that paper does is it estimates the condition number of this matrix. So the condition number of V for equally spaced points is ballpark, uh, two, root 2 over pi, that's a num number, that's fine, times 8 to the nth power. This is where using the Vandermann matrix becomes really a bad idea. All right, so if n equals 5, for example, then the condition number is somewhere around 29,500. Okay, I mean, well, that might be reasonable. You've got whatever, 15 digits of precision. You lose five of them, okay. You got 10 digits. But in real life, again, we're probably working with more than five data points. So we keep going. Maybe we go down to n equals 10. And doubling the number of data points, you know, ideally you'd be kind of doubling the condition number roughly. But what we actually get is something on the order of 966,700,000. And again, 10 is not that big a number in terms of number of data points. Uh, this is getting bad in a hurry. So, okay, theoretically, the Vandermann system works. It did something really useful for us. It let us prove we can do polynomial interpolation. But for actual like practical problems, it may not be the best approach. Um, so we're going to actually, you know, we'll do a diff some different approaches, and we'll see that they have different strengths and weaknesses. And one strength of this was it was very easy to prove this worked. Yeah. Is the idea behind the equally spaced points because that's the best case scenario? Is the idea between the equally spaced points because it's the best case scenario? Um, uh, for this, I think it was probably it's the easiest to analyze. 
I mean, I would also expect just to generate the phone number, but you don't want grouping. But, but certainly, I mean, do you want grouping? It maybe depends on your data a little bit. So if you have one region, some region where your function is varying quite a little bit, a lot, and another region where it's kind of smooth, um, you may want grouping of your data points. So equally spaced isn't always the best, um, but certainly it's the easiest. Um, and if things are falling apart in kind of the simplest case you can imagine, it's, it's not likely to get better when you complicate things. Sometimes things accidentally get better when you complicate things, but. And maybe it is really a horrible case, but you know it's still it's still a common case that we might want to use. Equally spaced points are common, right? Um, and even equally spaced points, we've got a very bad bound. Oh, so, plus we have to invert this matrix. So at this point, it's probably worth saying maybe there's a better way of doing polynomial interpolation. Um, now we can. The Vannermann system let us prove there's a unique polynomial interpolant. It relied on a particular basis, but there's more than one way we could write a set of basis functions that give us the same polynomials, that give us nth degree polynomials. We don't have to use the monomial basis functions. So that's where things really went wrong here, was we picked a bad basis. Um, you can think of it as kind of like these basis functions are almost parallel to each other, right? You know. As x squared and x cubed and x to the fourth, they start to look kind of similar to each other as n gets large. Uh, and that's kind of what's going wrong here, is that we're doing basis functions that are kind of almost parallel in some sense. And we've seen before that when we start having rows that are almost parallel, it's not so good. So let's try a different basis. Um, so, we are motivated, I think, by the desire to come up with an actual practical algorithm that's easy to implement. Is, is that fair? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, this was not so practical because you had to invert this big matrix that was ill-conditioned. What would be easy? The easiest thing would be if I could write my polynomial this way, where I didn't even have to do any work to solve for my coefficients. What if I could assume that my coefficients were just given by my data. And li is some basis function. Okay, so here my l's are my basis functions. Right? So if we could come up with what the l's are and, and that they weren't too hard to build. Then this would be super easy because, OK, I have the L's there, easy to build. I have my coefficients that just plucked straight out of my data. Uh, and then I'd have my polynomial. So this is easy. Looking for easy solutions is a really, really, really good approach when you're, when you're doing a lot of, of math. Uh, don't try the hard thing if you can try the easy thing first. OK, so what do we need to work out? We need to work out what these basis functions should be. Um, we know they should be polynomials of degree n or less, because at the end of the day, we want to get a polynomial of degree n or less. So let's see what needs to be true for these basis functions and see if we can generate them. So each li is a polynomial. of degree at most n. Now, what else do we want? We want the ith polynomial to pick out the yth data point, the ith data point, and ignore all the other data points. Right? So what does that mean? That means when I plug xi into here, I would, I would like to get 1. Right? that it just picks out yi straight away. And if I plug any other data point in here, I would like to get 0 so that my other data points ignore what this is. Right? They only want to look. When I plug in xi, it only wants to see yi. It doesn't want to see any of the other y's. So what I want is 
li of xi to equal 1, and I want li of any other data point to equal 0. Those are reasonable conditions. Does this make sense? Right? If we can do that, then, then we're done. Then the i basis function picks up the i data point. So let's see if we can construct a polynomial that does this. Um, well, what have I done? Uh, I've specified a bunch of roots of this polynomial. Actually, I've specified n roots of this polynomial, right? We have n plus 1 data points. OK, I'm, I'm ignoring 1 here. So x1, x, sorry, x0, x1, x2, up to xn, excluding xi. Those are all roots of this polynomial. So I should be able to write my polynomial like this if I factor my roots out. This is a Lagrange polynomial, exactly. Okay, I skip the ith one. Okay, so we're not quite done here, but this is a polynomial that has roots at all the right place. It has roots at these xj. Um, now, the last condition I need is to satisfy this. Um, this is already nth degree, so I, I can't bring any more x's into the mix, but I'm certainly allowed to put a coefficient in front of this. Right? So the coefficient I choose should make this true. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, well, I know if I plug in xi here, I get xi minus x0, xi minus x1, and so on. Uh, so my coefficient should really divide all of that out. I should have xi minus x0, xi minus x1, all the way down the line. And this, if I want to write this really compactly, we're doing a product here over all the j's, except for 1, except for j equals i, of x minus xj divided by xi minus xj. OK, um, so I don't have to do any crazy existence proof to say, let's prove such a polynomial exists. We just built it. It exists. It's degree n. Uh, it does all the things we need. If I plug in xi, yi pops out. Um, so this is a perfectly valid basis um, that lets me do polynomial interpolation. And indeed, uh, these are the Lagrange polynomials. Okay, Lagrange basis functions, and they give us an explicit representation of our interpolating polynomial. Looks OK. So we can do interpolation. It's pretty easy, right? Oh. Give me my data. I just have to plug my data into a, a formula. And it's kind of a long formula, but it's a formula nonetheless. It's explicit. There's no big matrix to invert. So what else should we worry about when we're doing interpolation? Error. Good, right? So what's the goal of interpolation? Again, the goal of interpolation is not to say, here's my data. Oh, look, I built a curve that passes through my data. The goal is to build that curve and then use that curve to make predictions at points where I don't have data. So we should try to get a handle on what is the actual error in this. In other words, how accurate is this whole representation?
Okay, so I'm going to write a theorem, which I, as I write it down, it's not obvious. This theorem is true. It's, it's maybe feasible. It's, it's probably believable, but it's probably not obvious. Um, and then we're going to go try to work out why this actually works. Okay, so we're trying to do interpolation of a function. My data came from something. Okay, so we, we knew from the Weierstrass approximation theorem, right, in order to do good function approximation, we just needed f to be continuous. Uh, now, that wasn't interpolation. Now we're actually trying to fit data points. We're building in this information about the shape. We're going to have error terms that involve now derivatives of f. So if we're doing nth order interpolation, we're going to end up needing the next order derivative of f. This, I mean, the, the error formula we see here is going to feel familiar. It's going to look very much like what we get when we do a Taylor remainder theorem. Okay, so we have a function that's nice enough. And we have these distinct data points. Okay, then let's look at the error. So the error at any point, uh, let me write it this way. Okay, so let t be some real number. Uh, and I'm going to say with t not equal to any of the data points. Right. We know if we plug in one of the data points xi here, we get yi coming out exactly. There's no error when we plug in an actual data point. And by definition, interpolation said we have to hit the data points exactly. Um, so it's not interesting what happens when we plug in data. It's interesting what happens when we plug in other things. Okay, so let's plug in other things. And now we want to know what's the difference between the actual value of f at t and our Lagrange polynomial. Okay, so our Lagrange polynomial. This again, this is just our interpolating polynomial. I could, I'm going to write it here in terms of my Lagrange basis. I could just as well write it in terms of my monomial basis that we got with the van der Mond system, right? It's the same polynomial. It's just written in terms of a different basis. This one is kind of convenient for doing the analysis, though. So but keep those in mind. These are the same polynomials. We're just writing them in different ways. And different ones have different benefits depending on what we're trying to do. Okay, so this was my yj, which is the same as f of xj, times my Lagrange polynomial. Okay, this is the error. And the error now can be written, again, almost what you expect to see uh, from a Taylor remainder theorem. Now, for a Taylor remainder theorem, you know, we don't have a bunch of data points. We've just got kind of one point that's going on here. And we'd expect to see t minus x naught to the n plus 1. Yeah. The interpolating polynomial as a function is unique. Exactly. So what we're discussing is the distinction between methods of building that polynomial and getting to that unique function. Yeah, so there's different, exactly. There's different methods of building that function, of getting to that function. But the, at the end of the day, the function is unique. So the point of the That's right. The van der Mond matrix, you know, it was easy to write down. It was easy to say, oh, we can prove that the polynomial is uniquely defined. That's great. But it was not good for practical computations. This is something where we can write things down explicitly. I don't have to solve a big linear system. Um, and it's going to turn out to be really easy to do a lot of this analysis. Um, but the same polynomial. So I don't have to write this in terms of the Lagrange basis. I could write this in terms of any basis that you like. I'm, I, I, close. I could do, I could do, yeah, any kind of basis that you like here. The, the monomial in terms of a Newton type basis, which we'll get to later, uh, in terms of, of anything. I'm writing it this way because doing it this way is going to make it easy to prove the theorem. But once we do this and we start talking about other bases, I can still use this theorem because this theorem is not specific to the Lagrange polynomials. OK, this is the form of my error. So, Instead of having you know, t minus x naught to the n plus 1, 
I've got to look at this product of all the t minus xi's. Everything else looks like what you expect from your uh, Taylor remainder theorem. I've got an n plus 1 factorial in the denominator. I have an n plus first derivative of f. And it's evaluated somewhere, but we're not sure where. So for some xi, uh, that it lies somewhere in between all of these points. Right, so x0, x1, xn are here, t is somewhere, and xi just lies somewhere in there, but we're not sure where. So there's a big range where xi could live. Um, and to the point of should we be doing extrapolation, well, if I imagined that you know, my x0 was here and my xn was here and my xi was way over here, um, or sorry, my t was way over here. Well, all of a sudden, that means t minus x0 is big, t minus x1 is big, t minus xn is big. All these terms are big, uh, and that's not going to do anything nice for your error estimate. Right? If, if we're in the middle here, at least some of the terms are small, and, and you can hope that you get a small result. OK, so this is our theorem. We want to try to prove it. OK, so I'm going to write down my error. Um, this is my error. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it E. So let's define the error as E of x is just the difference between f and my polynomial. Right? And again, this is one way of writing the polynomial, but not the only way. We know that we're going to be building in some higher order derivatives of this thing. You know, I mean, a priori, we don't know that. We're guessing that. The theorem tells us we should, but we haven't proved it yet. But it's a kind of a reasonable guess that we would want to build in higher order derivatives. Uh, so if I want to build in a higher order derivative of this, I'm just going to take a higher order derivative of the whole thing and see what that gets me. Um, the nice thing is p is a polynomial, so polynomials are very easy to take derivatives of. So if I take the n plus first order derivative, Okay, and I mentioned, right, uh, okay, f, we're not really sure what f is, it's some function, but p, we know, is a polynomial. Uh, it's this polynomial, you know, or whatever basis you like. What's the n plus first derivative of p equal to? It's going to be like n plus 1 factorial. So you think n plus 1 factorial? What other guesses? Yeah, 4 times some constant. Four, 0, why is it 0? It's an n degree polynomial, and we're taking n plus 1 derivatives of it, right? So if I imagined a zeroth order polynomial, it would be a constant. I take one derivative of it, goes away, right? A one degree polynomial, a linear function, I take two derivatives, it goes away. So since this is an nth degree polynomial, and that's something that would be easier to see, I guess, if we wrote this in terms of our van der Maan basis, the monomial basis, oh, so, and, which is fine. We can do, we can mix and match in here if we want to. So we know that this guy is zero since p is degree n or less. So that cleans things up a little bit. All right, let's see what else we can do here. Uh, we know this product is something that we're going to have to work with. Oh, so let's give that product a name. Okay, I'll call that C. Okay, this is again a polynomial, right? Um, this time uh, it's a higher degree polynomial. 
right? Because here I'm going from uh, x naught to xn, so this is an n plus first degree polynomial. Okay, uh, and what's the what's the f coefficient of xn plus one in this? What's the coefficient of x to the n plus 1? 1. 1, right? So if I multiply this all out, I don't want to multiply this whole thing out because that's there's a lot of terms. Um, but certainly if I want the leading order term, this is an x to the n plus 1. And then all the other terms are just something. So you make this a function of the leading order. Something where this is a nth order polynomial. Okay, so since we're busy taking n plus first derivatives, uh, what's the n plus first derivative of this guy? n plus 1 factorial. Now it's the right answer. Yes. Okay, so c n plus 1 x is now n plus 1 factorial. Right? So the derivative of this, which is easy, plus the derivative of this, which is 0 for the same reason as before. It's an nth order polynomial. So it was the right answer before, it was just at the wrong time. All right, so we're going to try to use all this information. So I'm going to define this new auxiliary function, so I'll call g. Let's say, you know, we're trying to do this um, in a way that lets us use the techniques we're used to using for these formulas. The kinds of techniques that we've usually used are like mean value type theorems, Taylor theorems, things like that. That's what I still want to be able to do. And maybe to use the special information that we've got lots of polynomials floating around, and we know things about polynomials. Um, we know things about how many roots polynomials can have, and so on. So let's define g to be equal to the error minus uh, And now I'm going to compare this, the error at x, so some general x, to the error at, at t that I compare about. Um, I'm going to scale it a little bit. I'm going to call this C of x over P of t times E of t. Now there are some special values that we could plug in here. So let's think back. Mean value theorem. What does the mean value theorem tell us in general? If we have a function that is continuing in a, a closed interval, okay. So we can find a point between those uh, between that interval such that the value difference of the function evaluated at the end point of the interval is equal to the derivative of the function evaluated at that point that we found. Right. So, right, mean value theorem says, okay, we've got a function. We look at its value at two points. The function is di differentiable and nice and everything. Then I can find a point in the middle where the slope is equal to the slope of the tangent line. Okay. Uh, there's a special case, I guess, if the function values are equal at those two points, right, then I could find a point in between where the slope is 0. So that's kind of our traditional mean value theorem. But there's higher order mean theorems, mean value theorems that let me talk about what goes on with higher order derivatives, right? So uh, let me just kind of recall this higher order mean value theorem. Uh, so, and this is something you've hopefully seen in analysis in 480, 481, I forget which one, 545, 546, whatever. Uh, so a higher order mean value theorem and I'm just recalling this because I think it's probably useful because it's the kind of technique we usually use for proving these things right so uh, let's suppose uh, that F uh, has all the derivatives that we need it to have Let's 
say C n has n plus 1 distinct roots. Right? Then there exists some C in between them, such that uh, the derivative, the nth derivative is equal to 0. Right? So for the special case where um, n equals 1, we just said what the mean value theorem was. If n equals 1, if there's two roots, so f is 0 at two points, right? then there's going to be some point in the middle where the first derivative is equal to 0. Now we bootstrap our way up. So if we want to bootstrap this a little bit, let's say... say we have three roots. So let's say f has three roots. Well, I could look in here and I could say, let's just focus on these two. There's a point in between where f prime has to equal zero, right? And if I focus on these two, there's a point in between where f prime has to equal zero. So if I go up to the first derivative, f prime, I know that somewhere here it's equal to 0, and somewhere in here it's equal to 0. All right, so it's going to do something like that. And I don't know the shape of it exactly, but I know that it has at least these two roots. And now I can say, well, let's take a derivative of this function. Right? Now I'm actually in the case where I can use my usual mean value theorem. So I say, all right, I have a function that I've called f prime. f prime has two roots. And that means we know that there's somewhere in between where the derivative of this function is equal to 0, right? Well, the derivative of this function, its name is f double prime. So there's somewhere in between where f double prime hits 0. Right? So um, that's, all, that's all we're doing here with this mean value, th this higher order mean value theorem. We're starting with n roots and saying, well, if f has n roots, then f prime has at least n minus 1 roots, and f double prime has at least n minus 2 roots, right? Uh, and we keep going, keep using this, the mean value theorem over and over again, and we get the nth derivative has a root. That's, that's all I'm doing here. I'm just using the mean value theorem over and over again. So this is a useful thing. It's kind of a common thing that would come up in this kind of error analysis. So we're going to see if we can use it. We're going to see if we can use it on, on this function. So we're going to see how many roots we can build of this function. So what are some roots of this function? Oops. T would be one of the roots. So if we go back to our function g, well, we know that g of t is equal to 0. Right? Why is that the case? Well, if I plug in t, here I get e of t. c of t divided by c of t is 1. So it's just e of t minus e of t, which is 0. What are some other roots? Can you, can you? My data points are roots. Exactly. Uh, so if I plug in uh, my data points, What's going to happen here? Well, if I plug in a data point here, the error is 0, right? When we're doing polynomial interpolation, the definition of interpolation is that I force my error to be 0 on the data point. So this is 0. Uh, if I plug a data point into here, right, I've got this product. One of the terms in the product is 0. So if I plug in a data point into here, I get 0. So g of xi equals 0 for i equals 0 to n. OK, so I've constructed a whole bunch of roots of this function here. Um, this function is nice. So 
This function has a bunch of derivatives, right? Um, the polynomials are infinitely differentiable. Uh, this was f minus the polynomial. f has uh, n plus 1 derivatives, we think. Or this is probably the part in the proof where we decide how many derivatives we require f to have. Uh, but we expect, in general, that g has n plus 1 derivatives. And now we know g has at least, okay, well, n plus 1 roots here, another one here. So at least n plus 2 roots. So what does the mean value theorem give me? Uh, it gives me something about the n plus first derivative, exactly. So my mean value theorem, my higher order mean value theorem says there exists some c such that g n plus 1 x c is equal to 0. Okay, so let's try to work out what this is. g n plus 1 is going to be e n plus 1 minus c n plus 1. Everything else uh, is a constant as far as x is concerned. Uh, and these derivatives we've worked out already, right? We worked them out right over here. The n plus first derivative of the error was just the n plus first derivative of my original function. Uh, and the n plus first derivative of c was n plus 1 factorial. So these derivatives we've already worked out ahead of time. Okay, so this was n plus first derivative of f minus n plus 1 factorial uh, times, times the error at t divided by this whole product, t minus x naught all the way down to t minus xn. Well, not only do we have a bound on the error, we can solve for the error exactly. I mean, exactly in terms of uh, this unknown beast. So this, we said, has to be equal to 0. That mean value theorem told us that, right? So now, what did I want? I wanted to come up with the error. So I'm going to just solve for the error in terms of everything else. Okay, so if I want to solve for that, I rearrange, solve for e, and that's my proof, exactly. Uh, so what do I get? I get all these product comes into the numerator, I get this n plus 1 factorial moving to the denominator, and I have my n plus first derivative of f. And that's, that's our proof. That's an expression for the error. Um, and that's, again, that's the kind of expression we expect to get for the error. It, it, it reminds us of like a Taylor remainder theorem or something like this. It's the kind of form of error that we'd reasonably expect to get. All right, so now if we happen to know what f is, or at least if we can say we have some bounds on how big the derivatives of f can get, now we're in business to come up with an error bound. So we could plug in our t that we're interested in and compute what all this is, put in what's the worst case value of this derivative, and now we have an estimate on, on the error. Yeah? Could we have just Taylor expanded the error since n plus 1? Could we have Taylor expanded the error? Uh, yeah, we could probably do that too. Okay, so. We used the Lagrange polynomial basis. It's kind of easy to build. Um, we came up with this error formula. Um, and let's just look at some pros and cons of our Lagrange polynomials. I'll say pros and cons. All right, so. What are some pros of the Lagrange basis? 
What do you like about it, Sam? Easy to it's easy to compute, right? So um, we've got an explicit formula, right? That's, that's easy to work with. Anything else? Jake. Probably pretty uh, expandable if you have more data. You just add it into it. Okay, so if we have more data, I can just add it into it. I'm going to hold off writing that down for a second, but that's actually an important point. Actually, a huge advantage is you don't have to solve a matrix for that. Yeah, we don't have to solve a matrix. Exactly. Explicit formula that does not involve the inverse of a matrix, right? Okay, the, you know, the monomial basis involved an explicit formula that involved B inverse. So that doesn't require matrix inversion. So yeah, the same thing that Sam said, basically. It's easy. Easy, practical. Um, the other thing that was nice about this, which we just did, it's really easy to prove things, right? Um, so if I'd tried to write this in a more complicated basis, you know, it may or may not be easy to actually prove things about this. Uh, but this, you know, we were, uh, at the core, it was this product that was coming up in here, and that product is easy to take derivatives of and do things. So the proofs are pretty easy, you know, as, as proofs go. That one's not too bad. Was more of a con in this case. You think Jake's point was more of a con in this case? So, Newton's, related Newton's device. Device. so you think there's a more of, so Jake said this is probably pretty easy to add more data to. You're saying maybe it's not, maybe there's a better way. So in fact, you're right. And that's why I didn't write it down at first. This is actually a con that say, oh, say I don't know, you know, say I start with something and then you give me more data, or say I have an error bound that I have to achieve. I don't want to use more data than I have to, right? Because this more data is more work. Uh, so maybe I try zeroth order interpolation, and I construct that polynomial, and then I say, well, it's error bound. I need to construct this product every time to check. Uh, that's not good enough. Let's try another data point. Well, back to the drawing board. I construct P1, check again. It's error bound, still not good enough. OK, back to the drawing board. I throw out all the work I've just done and, and start over until I'm finally happy with the polynomial. Or if you just say, OK, I've done some interpolation, and then you come over and say, oh, hey, I just gathered some more data. Can you kind of add this in? Well, now I have to throw out all the work I just did, start from scratch to build this. So, so this I'm going to call uh, a con. Um, it's not that easy to add in additional data. Data, you know, you have to start from scratch every time. Okay, and that may or may not be an issue depending on what you're trying to do. You have a question. I'm not sure if it's getting a little too ahead, but um, the assumption the entire time is we were using equidistant points. Um, so this, I mean, none of this assumed equidistant points. But when you introduce the variable, variable, uh, variable difference, like, I think there's an, is there an error that, that gets, gets uh, is there a difference in the error? Is there a difference in the air? So if the points are not uh, equidistant, uh, it's going to affect the particular value of this term. And actually, we're going to talk about that. Are equispace points the best? Are there better things to do? Um, so we will certainly get to that. Um, but yeah, the short answer is yeah, it can affect the air depending on where you pick your data points. Now, my question would be, uh, is that a pro or a con? Like the, the Lagrange polynomial, like, is it, are they optimized for equidistant points? Are Lagrange polynomials optimized for equidistant points? They don't really care. So remember, you say, these are the points I'm given. The interrelating polynomial is unique, right? It doesn't matter what basis we use. Um, and the amount of work I have to do here to build the Lagrange polynomials really doesn't care how far apart my points are. But it just says compute this product. Um, now, on the topic of computing this product, uh, it's a big product, right? So I have, say, n basis functions, or n plus 1 basis functions. Each of these basis functions requires this big product, right? So a, a product costs n operations. 
for, just for one basis function, I have to do n operations, and now I have to do this n times to get my full polynomial. So it's actually not that cheap to build these things, right? So each basis function costs, you know, order n operations. And that means if I need to build all of them, the polynomial itself with n data points is going to cost n squared operations to build. Well, and that's not maybe not ideal. It's especially not ideal if you then build the whole thing and decide this isn't accurate enough, let's start over. And all of a sudden, I do this for n equals 0, and for n equals 1, and n equals 2, over and over again. All of a sudden, we're looking at potentially n cubed operations until I've got uh, an interpolating polynomial that I'm happy with. So this is where I'm going to say there are some cons to this. Um, is that they're, kind of, they're actually kind of expensive to build, um, especially if you're not sure ahead of time how much data you really want to use. So this is indeed where we're, where we're going from here. Is so let's find another basis function involving these Newton divided differences uh, that will give us the same polynomial. Right? So the same polynomial means that we can reuse all the proofs we did over here. Or if we want to prove something new, we could come back to this formulation to do the proofs. But maybe there's a more computationally efficient way to build these things. Um, so that's where we're going to go from here. Um, I can't build those in the next nine minutes, um, so I'm not going to try. Um, so just a reminder, I'm going to post the next lecture uh, as a video. Um, hopefully tomorrow I'll get it up. Uh, and that will be in lieu of this Wednesday's class. Email me questions if you want to email me questions. I'm happy to uh, answer them by email. Um, and I'm happy to take more questions uh, on Monday uh, at the start of class. Um, but that will be on these Newton divided differences. Any other questions? Happy? OK, I'll let you go a few minutes early. Jake has one last question. Why was it hard to add the data? Like, so are we, when we construct the polynomial, are we saying we're going to get these coefficients? And then we'll actually like, write it out in like, a standard form of polynomial? Uh, so why is it hard to add the data? Um, so, I mean, the polynomials are easy to construct. I guess the problem is you've got to recompute these products every time. Okay, I was just thinking, like, if you left them in, like, the basis form, you just have to multiply the so denominator by whatever data you expect. So you'd have to multiply okay. the denominator by your new piece of data. Um, you'd, have to build a whole, you'd have to build a whole new basis function, uh, which is relatively complicated. So it's not like this is impossible, but... You know, if you have a lot of data, n squared is not that cheap to, you know, even just, even just to do this once is not, it's certainly not optimal. You know, the holy grail is order n uh, computation time. n log n is great because log n isn't too big. Uh, once you start to get up to n squared, that gets big fast if n is large. Is it good so you would have like